number 10 is Hawthorne Plaza Shopping Center. Located in Hawthorne, California, just outside of LA, this mall opened in 1977 and was once a booming metropolis filled with eager customers day and night. However, over time, as the economy shifted and crime rates began to rise in the area, the once bustling shopping center began slowly deteriorating and was forced to permanently shut its doors in 1999. Over the years, there were a few attempts to revamp and reopen, but none have proven fruitful. In fact, the owner of the mall was recently sent to prison for four years after bribing an LA County official in a scheme to sign a lucrative tenancy agreement. Nowadays, the mall is occasionally used by Hollywood for film sets, but generally speaking, it spends most of its time abandoned and rotting from the inside out. Early on, after the closure, looters stripped the mall of just about everything, including handrails, windows, and doors. However, what wasn't taken was destroyed, and the remaining infrastructure barely stands, either smashed, broken, or shattered to bits. Most recently in 2022, the mall was even more damaged after an arson attack believed to have been committed by someone squatting inside the abandoned mall. So overall, not a place you want to spend your afternoon. Next up at number nine, the Acropolis. Once a popular shopping center in a suburb of Mexico City during the late 80s, this ancient Greek inspired shopping center quickly declined by the end of the 90s and has sat eerily abandoned ever since. Now, obviously, all the malls on this list are spooky, but what makes this one different from the rest, as I already mentioned, is that it was originally designed as a tribute to ancient Greek architecture and as such is filled with towering columns that were designed to appear like ruins prior to this place even becoming an abandoned lot. I mean, you have to admit, there is something quite haunting about a place deliberately built becoming a decaying ruin itself. And that mixed with the several rumors that this place is haunted is enough reason to leave it alone. Next up at number eight, Northland Village Mall. Located in Calgary, Alberta, this mall is the most recent on the list to have shut down, only closing officially in 2021. It opened back in 1971 and did quite well for itself, even expanding in 2005. However, by 2021, due to a multitude of reasons, the mall shut down and there were even talks of demolition. That was until the hit show The Last of Us got their hands on it and used it for their abandoned mall episode. I don't know about you guys, but I am a huge fan of that show, so if there was one mall on this list that would make me just a little curious to visit, it would be this one. However, it is still a closed down mall, so, you know, probably not the best call. Plus, there are some rumors that it could be haunted, and if the ghosts are anything like the monsters from The Last of Us, then it is definitely the last place you will catch me. Coming in at number seven, Metro North Mall. Located in the Kansas City area, Metro North Mall opened its doors to the public in 1976, becoming not only the second largest shopping center in the area, but also the only enclosed mall north of the Missouri River. So you'd think there wouldn't be much competition. However, despite their size, just like other malls all around the world, it was the fall of their major anchor stores that forced them to throw in the towel in 2014. Since then, the mall has fallen destitute, with molding walls, warped flooring, and broken glass, making it resemble more of a haunted sanatorium than a shopping center. In fact, according to photojournalist Seth Lawless, who snuck inside, it is by far the creepiest place they have ever stepped foot in. So unless you are looking to inhale black mold or encounter some kind of evil spirit, this is not the place for you. Next up at number six, Randall Park Mall. Once the largest mall in the entire world, the Randall Park Mall opened in 1976 in North Randall, Ohio, with the dream of creating a city within a city. Now, 
While that is certainly a grand ambition, I would say they achieved it for some time. Inside there was of course tons of stores, but also apartments and performing arts centers, or you could spend an afternoon at one of their movie theaters inside. However, just like the other balls on this list, as the years went by, the large box stores like Macy's, Sears, and Higby's began leaving, and then after a suspected shoplifter was killed by an off-duty officer, the decline of Randall Park became inevitable. By 2009, the mall was shut down for good, but that only made it easier for vandals and looters to sneak in and turn the once beloved building into a rotting mess. Plus, due to the hasty closures in the months following Christmas, the decrepit stores are filled with eerie and falling apart toys and decorations, which only adds to the haunting feeling. Coming in at number five, Old Town Mall. Located in Baltimore, Maryland, this 200 year old outdoor mall has a long, tumultuous history and is for sure not a mall you'd want to poke around in at night. Originally named the Bel Air Market, Old Town Mall was built way back in 1818 and was originally intended to serve as a relief farmer's market to aid in the increasing commercial operations in the area. Now, at first, it did exactly as it was designed to do, and boosted business. However, when the post-war era began pushing families out to the suburbs, the area drastically declined in population, lost many of its customers, and soon became one of the poorest areas of the city. Sadly, this new demographic did not have the money to spend at the shops like the previous residents, and so stores were forced to either close or revamp to accommodate the new clientele. Despite a few attempts to revamp the area and bring it back to life, by the 1980s, the area was worse than ever, having deteriorated into a dangerous wasteland surrounded by crumbling buildings and a rising violent crime rate. Today, it stands a ghost town said to be filled with spirits of those who've died here, and it is definitely not somewhere you want to mess with. Next up at number four, Rolling Acres Mall. Found in Akron, Ohio, the Rolling Acres Mall has a long list of incidents, both pre and post shutdown, that definitely make it one of the scariest buildings on this list. Built in 1975, the mall opened with only 21 stores, but eventually expanded to 150 by 1995. The big box stores like JCPenney, Macy's, and Target were only a few of the things that drew the public in. And it honestly had quite a few good years, until it didn't anymore. In 1986, the field behind the mall was the site of a brutal double homicide, and that, coupled with the rise of theft in the area, began to taint its reputation. Soon customers began finding new shopping centers to go to, and without the usual cash flow, shops began dropping left, right, and center. Eventually by 2008, the mall shut down for good and has since become a ghost town. To make matters worse, after the close, apparently another dead victim was found here. And if that wasn't enough to scare people off, a man was electrocuted and fatally caught fire after attempting to steal some copper wiring that was inside the building. After the increasingly dangerous incidents, the mayor made a statement urging citizens to please keep out and away from the deteriorating building, and even though it was demolished in 2017, some say that the souls who died here haunt the grounds, terrorizing anyone who steps foot on the property. Coming in at number three. Dixie Square Mall. Located in Harvey, Illinois, this mall was only operational for a short 12 years between 1966 to 1978, and in the years following its closure developed quite a sour reputation. Shortly following the shutdown in 1979, the abandoned site was briefly used as a temporary school, and in 1980 it became known as the site of the famous mall car chase scene in Blues Brothers. However, from there, things took a corner. During the 80s and 90s, Dixie Square was featured in multiple national news reports due to high levels of trespassing, vandalism, and theft. 
and sadly, the crime only worsened as the years went on. However, unable to pay for the repairs that would keep vandals out of the crumbling shopping center, the city was pretty much forced to just watch as the building was torn apart scrap by scrap. Every window has been smashed open, the trademark Dixie sign was stolen along with any remotely salvageable materials, and the ruins caught fire twice. Plus, if that wasn't enough cause for concern, this mall was also the site of a brutal homicide. So yeah, it's definitely not a building you are able to enter. Coming in at number 2, Gwinnett Place Mall. Probably the most famous on this list, Gwinnett Place Mall, located in Duluth, Georgia, is a mall that has likely appeared on your TV and you didn't even know it. So its big claim to fame is that it was used as the filming location for the Star Court Mall in Stranger Things Season 3. However, despite this, this ghost mall still has a very dark reputation. When it first opened in 1984, the mall had big name stores like Macy's and Sears, but even so faced stiff competition and lost a lot of its customer base after the Mall of Georgia opened in 1999, followed by Sugarloaf Mills in 2001. The once booming center began putting up storefronts for lease, and eventually by 2013, things became so destitute that the previous owner lost the mall to foreclosure. However, this wasn't the end just yet. In 2017, the body of a 19 year old woman was found in the back room of the food court, having somehow gone unnoticed for weeks. And the following year, several employees were robbed and assaulted in the parking lot. The next few years, the parking lots outside turned into a hub for escorts, drug running, and vandalism, among many other things. Eventually, it became a ghost town, and today, it is absolutely somewhere you want to steer clear of. Last up in our number one spot is New World Mall. Some malls closed due to financial problems, some due to crime. However, what sent the New World Mall in Bangkok into retirement is one of the wildest reasons of them all. New World Mall opened its doors to the public in 1983 and was once a major community hub. However, things took a turn in 1994 when the Bangkok Metropolitan Administration took the owner to court after they illegally added seven floors to the building. As it turns out, the court ruled that the new floors violated safety standards, and so by 1997, they ruled that floors 5 through 11 had to be removed. However, in 2004, several years after the ruling, a fire caused the roof to tragically cave in, and a piece of the building struck a bystander, killing them instantly, and shut down the mall forever. Now, you would think that the bad news stopped there, but due to the rainfall that could now enter the building, the bottom floor flooded entirely and became infested with mosquitoes. Trying to make lemonade out of the situation, residents began introducing various species of fish in the hopes that they would eat the mosquito larvae and keep the situation at bay. Now, to be fair, it did kind of work. However, in 2015, the fish and mosquito infested mall lake was drained. That being said, it is an absolute death trap of a building and definitely not somewhere the public has access to visit. Starting us off at number 10 is Lake Buena Vista Airport. If there is one thing that Disney does best, it's branding their empire. And once upon a time, an airport, of all things, was a part of the Disney dynasty. You see, when Walt was first trying to create Epcot, the community, not the theme park, he wanted a regional airport with four runways. This vision did not quite come to fruition, but what we did get was the 1971 Buena Vista Airport. This boutique airport, if you will, was only used by two airlines and was meant for Disney guests and employees. And the biggest feature it became known for was that when you wish upon a star played after landing thanks to small grooves in the runway. However, cute factor aside, despite Walt's grand plans, the dream began to die in the 1980s with the construction of the monorail. The airport, now surrounded on either side, became dangerous to use, and so eventually eventually no more flights were allowed in or out. Nowadays, the abandoned airport is mostly used for storage and parking rather than an attraction for the public, but it's said that Walt's abandoned plane is hidden somewhere on the lot. And who knows, maybe his ghost is still in there.
there. Next up at number 9, The Wonders of Life Pavilion. I don't know about you, but when I think about Disney, I don't usually jump to health education. Well, as it turns out, the plan for the original Epcot included a pavilion that was to be dedicated to life and health, which eventually made its debut in 1989. The main attraction of this pavilion was called Body Wars, which was a ride that aimed to simulate what it felt like to travel through the human bloodstream, which had I had the chance, I would for sure have wanted to get on to live out my magic school bus dreams. However, despite running for nearly 18 years, the Wonders of Life Pavilion closed without any explanation in January 2007. At the time of its closure, there were of course tons of rumors, however the true reason has never been verified. It was just boarded up and closed off. which. Is definitely a bit suspicious, but could there be something they are hiding from the public that's locked away? I guess we'll never know. Next up at number 8, Pirates of the Caribbean. As the legend goes, during the construction for the Florida version of the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, a welder named George was killed in an accident. Now, the exact accident that happened to George does vary depending on who you ask. Some say he was crushed by a falling beam, while others say that he fell from the burning city portion of the ride and died as a result. But no matter how he died, everyone can agree on one thing. that he he remains haunting the ride and terrorizing anyone who dares disrespect him. It said George will stop the ride if he hears you say that you don't believe he's real. And superstitious cast members will greet George when they arrive and say goodbye when they leave to try and stay on his good side. So with that being said, while it's not technically prohibited, it's not exactly somewhere you want to mess with. So if you do decide to take your chances, make sure you don't piss off George. You never know what might happen. Next up at number 7, Haunted Mansion. This next one is a story from a visitor at Disney World in Florida while riding the Haunted Mansion who claims they witnessed a ghost and allegedly have the photo to prove it. Quote, as you'll see in the photo, it appears as though a young boy is peeking his head out of the doom buggy and looking directly at me. Not only was he not there when I took the pic, there wasn't a boy of this age within 20 people in front of me in line. And as you can see, he's only a few doom buggies in front of me. Not only that, What's he doing looking at me? There is no flash and no visible light coming from me. It's all infrared and invisible to the naked eye. So could it be that the haunted mansion is in fact haunted by real ghosts? Just tread carefully if you try to find out for yourself. You never know what they could want from you. Next up at number 6, Walt's Apartment. Depending on how much of a Disney fan you are, you may or may not be familiar with a certain apartment that's located above the firehouse on Main Street at Disneyland. The reason for this apartment was initially nothing terribly exciting, but simply because Mr. Disney himself wanted a place to stay that was on the property to make those late nights and early mornings a little easier. Now, to be fair, Walt's apartment isn't really prohibited anymore. You can go see it if you like, but the question is, should you? Well, nowadays a light is always left on in the front window. According to the legend, this wasn't always the case. It's said that one day a cast member looking after the apartment tried to turn the light off before leaving. However, after leaving the building, she looked up only to notice that the light was still on upstairs. Confused, but assuming she must have forgotten. She went back up to turn it off and came back downstairs. But once again, it was on. So she went up again, unplugged the lamp, only to find it once again still somehow back on by the time she came downstairs. The final time she went up, she heard an angry voice saying, quote, I'm still here. And she was so frightened, she ran away and never returned back to work. Who could that voice have belonged to? No one knows for sure, but the light remains on so as to never anger it again. 
Coming in at number five, Dolly's Dip. In 1984, Regina Young, or Dolly, as she liked to go by, was tragically killed while riding the Matterhorn. It seems there was a malfunction in Dolly's seatbelt, resulting in her falling out of the bobsled and being struck by an oncoming sled. The family eventually settled with the park, and the park simultaneously changed the kinds of seatbelts used for that attraction. However, the park says that the two events are unrelated. Now, of course, the Matterhorn remains a public ride, so you're free to take your chances on it, but be warned, it's said that the ghost of Dolly haunts the ride, specifically at the location she was killed. Referred to as Dolly's Dip, visitors and employees alike say they have been haunted by her presence while inside. Some say they can feel her watching them, while others claim to have seen a full-bodied apparition. But unless you're looking for a little paranormal action on your next Disney trip, then I would suggest lining up for a different ride. Coming in at number four, Nara Dreamland. Located in Japan, Nara Dreamland opened its doors to the public back in 1961. Now, from the get-go, the plan for this park was to be a part of the Disney franchise. In fact, Kunizo Matsuo, president of the Matsuo Entertainment Company, apparently met with Walt Disney to discuss the attraction with the plan of it being an official Disney park in mind. However, allegedly, after disagreements over the licensing fees for using the Disney characters, there was a huge falling out and Nara Dreamland was officially not an affiliated park. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, what the hell is this doing on a Disney list? Well, despite its lack of official Disney representation, it sure resembles a Disney park if I've ever seen one. Or rather, it did prior to its 2006 closure. Attractions like a large Matterhorn mountain, castle, and even a monorail found, and for many years it remained a ghost town, overgrown with nature and filled with an eerie presence. This of course caught the attention of Disney and horror fans alike for a while, but you had to be incredibly careful, as it was said visitors could be fined and arrested for trespassing into the abandoned property. However, as of 2017, the former theme park was demolished. But make no mistake, it's still not somewhere you should go poking around. While it was abandoned, some that snuck in complained of feeling like they were being watched or haunted by an angry entity, and it's believed that those same ghosts still haunt the grounds where it used to stand. Coming in at number three, Nighttime Trespassers. In 1966, 19 year old Thomas Guy Cleveland tried to sneak into Anaheim's Disneyland by scaling the park's outer fence and climbing along the monorail track. Now, why he was trying to sneak in after hours, we don't really know. But nonetheless, his devious plan all came to a halt when a nearby security guard noticed him. At first, he approached to get him to leave, but then he noticed a monorail was making its way along the tracks, and so he began yelling at Cleveland to get out of the way. At this point, Cleveland jumped and landed on a fiberglass canopy beneath the track to try and clear it. But unfortunately, the canopy did not keep him safe. From there, the 25 kilometer an hour monorail struck Cleveland and dragged his body for 40 feet down the track. By the time the monorail had made a complete stop, his body had been torn to pieces. So whatever you do, for the love of God, don't try to scale the wall and sneak in at night. It might be the last night you ever have. Coming in at number two, Discovery Island. Originally called Treasure Island, after the 1950 film of the same name, this Disney park opened to the public in 1974 as a premier tourist destination for Disney fans of all ages. Accessible only by resort boat or Disney cruise lines, the original park revolved around the theme of shipwrecks, secret caves, and buried treasure. However, in April 1976, Disney decided to rebrand to the new Discovery Discovery Island. This rebranding waved goodbye to pirate boats and treasure and instead welcomed rich flora and fauna hoping to invite a more relaxing atmosphere all while simultaneously showcasing and protecting Florida's local wildlife. Which to be fair, it did for a while. Discovery Island was accredited by the Association of Zoological Parks and Aquariums and at its peak housed over 500 endangered species. However, much to the public's surprise, Discovery 
island was abandoned in 1999. The animals were relocated to a new park, Animal Kingdom, and the island park has remained a ghost town ever since. Now, while it's sort of unclear as to why it shut down, some reasons include wild roaming alligators along with deadly bacteria found in the park's waters. And while all of that might sound intriguing, I promise you, you do not want to try and visit this one. Walt Disney World has banned all outings to the park. In fact, you're not allowed to get within 50 feet of its shoreline, and legal action can be taken if you're found trespassing. And that's not just a threat, people have actually been banned from all Disney parks for life for attempting to visit. So yeah, if I were you, I would steer clear of this one. And last up in our number one spot, River Country. After opening as the first water park at the Walt Disney World Resort in 1976, River Country was a popular destination for many years. And out of all of the places on this list, this one definitely has the wildest backstory. Controversy around the water park started to bubble up back in 1980, when a boy tragically died there due to an amoeba that was found in the water. The amoeba in question managed to kill him by attacking his brain and nervous system. However, Disney was absolved of the blame due to the fact that that specific amoeba could have bred in any fresh water. But the story's not done yet. Fast forward two years to 1982, and another boy died at River Country, this time from drowning on the Whoopenhaller slide. This time, Disney was sued by the family of the boy, who claimed that there was no proper warning about how deep the water was. And a lifeguard testified, admitting that they had to routinely save dozens of people from that slide on a daily basis. Even so, the park remained open. Then in 1989, another boy drowned there. However, it wasn't until the events in September of 2001 went down that Disney was forced to close the park due to the nationwide tourism cutback. From that day forward, the doors have remained shut and the park has been closed off to the public, though some believe that those who have lost their lives still roam around haunting the grounds. Kicking off our list here at number 10, we have Mount Weather. Not to be confused with Mount Chiliad, although that one's quite mysterious as well. We'll save that for another video. Mount Weather in Virginia is an emergency operations center. It's the go-to spot in case of any national emergency. These are for the higher, higher ups, you know what I mean? Like in the movie 2012, they would have went here. The facility is around 560 acres, and it's also used as the command center for the Federal Emergency Alert System. So if there were ever a day where the president needed to announce anything massive, this is where he'd go to do so. It's about an hour away from Washington, D.C., and after the 2001 September attacks, the news reported that these high-level leaders of Congress were taken just 75 miles west of Washington. There was a literal traffic jam of government vehicles going that direction. Also, from above, Mount Weather looks like it's hiding military-style support housing. These notches in the side of the hill are peculiar, to say the least. And that's just the beginning of our list here. Number 9, Randolph Mack and Women's College. Yeah, when you think of a doomsday bunker or anything hidden below the surface of the earth, you're thinking airports, right? Something massive, vaults in the middle of the Arctic maybe, some secret Bermuda Triangle, alien base, whatever. Well, look no further than Lynchburg, Virginia at Randolph College. So around World War II, just like most of these places that I'll mention on this list, a bunker was made to protect people, government officials, and sometimes art. The National Gallery of Art hid paintings in North Carolina, so another privately funded facility at Randolph College was also at the ready. It was this three bedroom hideout for the gallery's curator. You can't forget about art on this list, it's also important. Number eight, the Shanghai Complex. Most of the details of this one are still unknown, as are the other ones on this list as well. How fun is that? A mysterious Shanghai Complex, let's talk about it. It's this massive underground bunker, as you probably could have guessed, and it's supposedly able to fit 200,000 civilians comfortably. It's over 100 million square feet, and it was built in case, well, a nuclear attack were to happen. This was revealed through a newspaper article back in 2006. Imagine reading about this one morning, I'd be like, hi, what? What? The Shanghai Morning Post touched on the new complex saying that it's got massive protective doors, electricity, good lighting, good ventilation, all that good stuff, and it can fully support life for two full weeks. And yes, it's very secure. Number seven, Pine Gap. Going to the land down under for this one, here we go. Pine Gap is a secret military compound built around the Cold War, and it's been described as Australia's Area 51. Doesn't mean that there's aliens there, but you never know. All we know of this secret base on this mysterious island was revealed back in 2013 thanks to our man Edward Snowden. 
Yeah, he revealed quite a bit, actually. Turns out this island is not a fun resort. In fact, it's a satellite surveillance base that runs espionage operations. And it's got a lot of underground hidden bunkers. You can't even get close to this thing. The NSA is currently using this facility for global interception, and they also collect internet and telephone communication records. So your voicemail to Chad is probably lying in a USB somewhere. Back in the 70s, around 400 American families moved to the nearby Alice Springs. Why? Eh, just for fun, it seems. Just for the waves. Just for surfing the web and the waves. Number six, the Greenbrier. Located in Sulphur Springs in West Virginia, this US hideout was crucial during, you guessed it, the Cold War. Just 250 miles west of the capital city, the Greenbrier Resort got a fun little expansion as it was being built back in 1958. This expansion to the resort was not another spa, there was no water parks, no splash pool, anything like that. Rather, it was a secret bunker for United States Congress. This bunker was more of an underground city, if anything. When I say bunker, it's like a little where you have to hide in. No, this had a massive cafeteria. This had a dentist's office in case you get a cavity while you're hanging out down there. The crazy thing was, obviously this information was kept under wraps as best as they could, but according to Jared M. Graff, author of Raven Rock, conferences were being held in these public spaces at this resort, but the people walking through there never realized what these actually were. They never realized the bunker's true intentions. It was a doomsday chamber all around them this whole time, and they're having resort meetings. One thing employees did notice was how many urinals were in the building, which is, to be fair, that's kind of funny. That's the first thing I would notice. Number five, Denver International Airport. Since its opening in 1995, Denver International Airport, DIA, has been the subject of many myths. I've heard about this before, this is hilarious. I think it's in Tony Hawk, probably, I don't know. Some are so bizarre I had to include it on our list today. Yeah, lizard people, apparently they like to build airports. The more you know. So far it's believed that the Freemasons built the airport, or the Illuminati, or the New World Order. The airport itself is massive. It covers around 52 square miles. There's literal gargoyles that are just hanging out near baggage claim. The art displayed there is a little odd, so I get it. It does seem creepy. Maybe you want to know more about it. But the airport has started to lean into this conspiracy. They're actually laughing at this stuff by now. They have a conspiracy month that began back in 2016. How fun. Imagine going to the airport and they're like, oh, it's conspiracy month. I'm like, what? what? I just want to fly Delta. What's going on? They even show a screening of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So, yeah, like I said, they're really leaning into this. I would have leaned into something too if I was hiding a secret bunker and if I was guilty. Just saying. Number four, Project Iceworm. Oh, here's a fun one. As a Canadian, this project sounds like the worst one on this list. So impossibly cold. It's so cold out today. I'm freezing doing this list. Back in 1960s, under the Greenland Ice Sheet, the US Army started to build a mobile nuclear missile launch site. The code name was Project Iceworm, which is pretty fitting under the ground and ice. You got it, I didn't have to explain it. They were close enough that they could hit targets within the Soviet Union, right? That was the entire point here. This project was called Project Iceworm, but there was another project called Camp Sentry that had to be completed first. You can't just show up with a bunch of shovels and be like, all right, let's attack them. No, you have to make a base first. You gotta make sure it's livable. Camp Sentry was a network of underground tunnels and places for workers to stay. There was a kitchen, a hall, supply rooms, communication center, all that good stuff. There was also a nuclear power plant, so things were getting pretty Official, things were well on their way, to say the least. This was kept from the Danish government for seven years, but in 1966, the project was canceled because of shifting ice. Or was it? Number three, the floating White House. This one's not an underground bunker per se, but it was once a doomsday ship, that counts. Also, it's under the water, so it can technically blow uh, Earth level, I don't know. This was back in 1962, before Air Force One, there was a presidential yacht or two. These yachts sound glamorous, but really it's just a floating doomsday bunker. Lincoln had a steamboat during the Civil War that he used, and it was called the River Queen. The USS Mayflower was used by Roosevelt. Then later on, two Navy command ships were ready in the 60s. There was a light cruiser and a light aircraft carrier, one of which was always in the water near the president, just floating by, just lurking about. This is when the Soviet Union had a weak Navy, so the odds of them finding the president's ship in the Atlantic, well, those odds were slim. That is until, of course, satellite technology became a thing Thing, and then we started looking down from above, and then after that, the floating presidential bunker wasn't hidden, obviously. It's probably the worst place to put a president at this point, actually. Just in the middle of the water. They're like, eh, let's play Battleship, I guess. Number two, Metro 2. How fitting, two and two, let's do it. An underground metro or an underground city. Over in Moscow, there have been many tales of this underground city hiding deep beneath Russia's capital. Once World War II ended, these underground shelters were underway. And originally they were designed to protect civilians, but they had to be done in secret. And also you needed roads to connect these bunkers. So we might as well create a second metro. We'll call it that, a second metro. It was labeled as Metro 2. 
The rumors, of course, are that these hidden tunnels and bunkers are still being used by the KGB. Back in 1994, this exploration group called the Diggers supposedly found the entrance to this underground KGB tunnel city. Living in Toronto, we have one underground subway station that's like kind of abandoned. Pretty sure the KGB isn't hiding there. I haven't checked though in a while, but maybe I'll take a look. I'll get my boys the Diggers and we'll go and take a look. And finally, number one, the Svalbard Vault. Over the pandemic, I spent a lot of time playing video games and stuff like that, obviously, keep my mind busy. And most of my favorite games, I realized, have a similar like doomsday, post-apocalyptic feel, like Fallout 4, I was playing it, and I'm like, this isn't really, this feels stressful. It's stressful, but quite engaging. And in real life, we have a global seed vault, and it's deep, deep in the Arctic Circle on the island Spitsbergen. It's this massive bunker that has since been deemed the Doomsday Vault. How fun. This is where humans will store food crops and it contains 100 million seeds. So if the earth all of a sudden gets wiped out or even if all the ice melts, this vault will be good to go. We won't survive, but we have seeds. All that water just flooded the rest of humanity will now regrow the earth, ideally, which sounds so horrible, but weirdly cute. I'm kind of concerned. Is there something we don't know about this vault? Is that seed guy from Breath of the Wild hanging out in there with his loud maracas? Or Santa? I mean, Santa's only 800 miles away from this area, so he could be hiding here. You never know. Starting off this countdown, we have the Bluffs. Scarborough, Ontario is known for their bluffs. We call them the Scarborough Bluffs. It's a very popular place to go to, and the view is amazing. Tons of people like climbing to the top of the bluffs and then like looking down at the lake below. But over the time, the bluffs have been subjected to erosion and have had landslides. And some of the ground on top of the bluffs has been known to give away under people's feet. if They get too close to the edge. As a result, they fenced off the bluffs to avoid this from happening. They even have a security guard monitoring the area to prevent people from going to these bluffs. Sadly, people still don't listen and a number of people have snuck their way to the top of the bluffs. A number of people have fallen to their death. In 2018, there were 18 incidents that involved people falling down from the bluffs. People don't understand just how dangerous this area is. They look at it as a good photo opportunity. In our ninth spot today, we have Disneyland. Now you might be like, Huh? Lindsay, Disney is not a prohibited location to visit. Well, yes, you're allowed to go there during the day when it's open, but it's illegal to try to enter the park and trespass when it's closed during the night. That's what teen Thomas Guy Cleveland tried to do in 1956. Now the park wasn't completely closed. It was hosting their annual grad night. Thomas thought it would be a good idea to try to sneak into the park. So he climbed over the park's 16 foot high fence. Then he climbed onto the monorail track. His plan was to then run along the monorail track until he was inside the park and then jump or climb down. However, this didn't go according to plan. While trying to sneak into the park, the monorail came along the track and struck him. It ended up dragging his body 30 to 40 feet down the track. He sadly lost his life. In our eighth spot today, we have SeaWorld. What's with people trying to sneak into amusement parks at night? This is another example of it gone terribly, terribly wrong. On July 6th of 1999, a man named Daniel Dukes snuck into SeaWorld. It said that Daniel was kind of a hippie and he loved animals. All he wanted to do was to be able to swim with the whales. So he stayed into the park until it closed and then managed to elude security in order to make his way to Tillicum's tank. That's where he hopped in naked and swam around. Sadly, Tillicum attacked and killed him. He was found the next day dead, floating on the back of Tillicum. His body was so badly disfigured from the whale that they had to do a closed casket funeral. In fact, chunks of his skin and body were found floating around the tank. In our seventh spot today, we have the Hawaii Blowhole. The Halom Blowhole in Hawaii is quite an amazing sight to see, but it is very, very dangerous. Hence why it's fenced off and surrounded by signs saying no trespassing. Well, in June of 2002, Daniel Dick and his family went on vacation in Hawaii. Where they were staying was connected to a beach and the beach was right by this blowhole. One morning, Daniel went out to the beach alone and started chatting up some girls. From there, he convinced them to come with him to this blowhole. While there, Daniel hopped over the fence and went directly to it. He hovered over the blowhole until it shot up water. Daniel ended up shooting up into the sky and then on his way down, he fell into the blowhole. He was then trapped in there and it was high tide, so it was impossible to swim out or to climb out of it the way that he came in. He was stuck in there for nearly 20 hours before it was safe to save him. But by that time, he had already died. 
In our sixth spot today, we have the Stairway to Heaven. Located in Hawaii, the Stairway to Heaven is considered one of Hawaii's most dangerous trails. It's very steep and a number of people have died or have gotten badly injured from climbing it. As a result, it was closed in 1987. But that didn't stop Dalen Pua. On February 27th of 2015, Dalen trespassed into the area and decided to climb this path. He had done so without telling his family where he was going. He knew that they would stop him because his grandmother told him just how dangerous it was. Sadly, he never returned home. His body was never found. The last time Dalen's family ever heard from him was around 11 a.m. that day when he texted his family a photo of him at the trail. Theory goes that he ended up falling to his death. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Pelican Valley. In July of 1984, a woman named Brigitte Friedenhagen and her three pals were exploring this area. Brigitte had plans to stay the night in Pelican Valley, which is near Yellowstone National Park. It is very dangerous though. In fact, park rangers say you should only go there if you're in a group of four to seven during the day and you have to stick to the path. Brigitte, however, decided to go alone and camp the night. That night, she was attacked and killed by a bear. It dragged her out of her tent by her skull and sadly ate her. The park rangers literally warned her about staying there alone, but she assured them that she was an experienced camper and that she could handle it. Sadly, the park rangers were right. In our fourth spot, we have Snake Island. Now, I didn't mention Snake Island in my last video and I got so many comments being like, what about Snake Island? But then when I do mention Snake Island, you guys are like, ugh, not Snake Island again, so I can't win. But I will say it does deserve a spot on today's list, so I'm putting it there. So as most of you know, Snake Island is a very dangerous island located in Brazil. And that's because this island is home to around 4,000 snakes. Most of them being Golden Lancehead Vipers, aka one of the deadliest serpents in the world. It's said that this type of viper can grow up to 18 inches long, and it's so poisonous that one bite can kill you within an hour. A number of people who have gone to this island have wound up dead. First off, we have the family that was actually running a lighthouse on the island from 1909 to the 1920s. That was until the entire family was found dead in the lighthouse from snake attacks. Another time, a fisherman came to the island searching for bananas and he never made it home. He was found days later in his boat in a pool of his own blood. As a result, the Brazilian government has banned anyone from ever going there. And if you do, they say that you won't make it back alive and you'll die within an hour. In our third spot today, we have Yellowstone Hot Springs. Yellowstone has a number of natural springs that are absolutely beautiful. Some you're even allowed to swim in. Others will literally cook you alive. In fact, at least 22 people have died from hot spring related injuries. As a result, there are clear signs on areas you can and cannot visit. All visitors must remain on the boardwalk. Straying off this path can be deadly, and that's what happened to Colin Nathaniel Scott in June of 2016. He was with his sister out looking for a place to hot pot, aka to soak in some warm water, and while out looking for this place, he ended up slipping and falling into a boiling hot spring. Emergency services were unable to retrieve his body right away. By the time that they got to him, his body had dissolved from the boiling temperatures. All that was left of him was his wallet and melted flip-flops. In our second spot today, we have North Sentinel Island. Now, this is another island that we have talked about a lot on this channel. Again, it definitely deserves a spot on today's list. Now, the island is home to a tribe that is so isolated from the rest of the world, and they do not like outsiders, which makes sense, okay? They just want to protect themselves and their home. But a man named John Allen Cho thought that it was his job to help him, that this is what God wanted him to do, and if he taught them Christianity, then he could change their lives. So on November of 2018, he headed out to this island. Although a number of people refused to take him there and literally told him that it was a death wish. In the end, he made multiple attempts to befriend the Sentinelese, but they were not having it. They would fire arrows at him to try and get him to leave, but he was persistent. November 16th was the last time anyone would ever see Alan again. Alan was dropped off on the island and when the boater went back to get him, he saw tribe members dragging his dead body by a rope. 
And in our number one spot today, we have the Nika Caves, Mexico. Now this is a beautiful cave filled with giant crystals or gypsum pillars. The cave was discovered in 1910 when miners were drilling in the area, but soon the area was deemed unsafe. And that's because of the climate. The air temperature is around 113 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 47 degrees Celsius. And the humidity is killer, literally. The levels were close to 100%, meaning if anyone was in there for more than 10 minutes without special breathing apparatuses, then their lungs will fill with water and they will drown. So the caves were closed off. That was until two miners drilled into it while searching a separate area nearby. When they got inside, they saw all these giant crystals. They're like, uh, you're coming home with me. Little did they know the hazard of being there. So one of the miners started sawing off one of the giant crystals. However, it ended up falling and pinning him under it. Now, this didn't actually kill him. What killed him was being in this hot environment for too long. It said that he either drowned to death or that he was cooked alive. Kicking off the list at number 10, Snake Island. Well, this island already sounds awful. What's going on here? Snake Island is located 95 miles off the coast of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Is that just a name of an island or do a bunch of snakes live here? Well, sorry to tell you. Both. What happened originally was thousands of years ago, the part of the land that once connected the island to mainland disappeared. The ocean rose up before any of these snakes had time to pack their snake bags and they were stuck on this island forever. These snakes were stuck on the island decade after decade, so now these stuck snakes are just gonna, you know, mate and have more snakes. Now the island's full of snakes. The number of snakes is going up. Higher and higher, it's never stopping. One of the deadliest snakes in the world, the Golden Lancehead Viper, yeah, there's over 4,000 of them on this island. It's horrible. Back from 1902 to the early 1920s, a few brave souls lived there and operated the lighthouse. But according to some local myths, the last lighthouse keeper was swarmed by snakes after he left a window open. Worst thing I've ever heard, let's move on. Number nine, Surtsey Island. While some islands ban humans, others ban humans and seeds. Yeah, no seeds allowed on Surtsey Island. Leave the work snackies behind, my friend. Surtsey Island is an important one on our list here today, as this island was born in 1963. We got a brand new baby island. This new island emerged from the sea 20 miles off the coast of Iceland, and it took around four years for Mother Nature to complete this little passion project. An undersea volcano formed this island over the course of four years. Just slowly, just making a new island. That's a long, hot process, so now what? What do you do with a brand new island? Sandals Resort? Disney Parks? No and nope. Nobody is allowed on this island. The whole idea of Surtsey Island, which I love, is that scientists are trying to study how ecosystems can form themselves without the involvement of us, of us humans. Scientists around the world have all gathered around to do nothing about this island. They're just gonna watch. Only a select few can enter this island, and right before they clock in, they're checked head to toe to make sure they don't have any seeds. Zero seeds. Why? Oh, because scientists found a tomato growing and they were scratching their heads. Where did this come from? How, out of nowhere, how could it be? They were stumped until they found out somebody went number two in that same spot long before. Yeah, welcome to Surtsey Island. Hold it. Better not take a shit here or you're fired, buddy. Number eight. North Sentinel Island. Heading over to India, this island is the home of the Sentinelese tribe. One of the most forbidden islands on the world. We're talking about it, let's do it. Located in the Bay of Bengal, North Sentinel Island is about 1,200 kilometers away from India. And while most islands are shrinking, this one is actually growing. It grew back in 2004 phenomenally. Back in 2004, the island lifted up a couple of meters during an earthquake. So the west and south sides gained an extra kilometer. The inhabitants on North Sentinel Island are among the few uncontacted tribes left in the world. You've probably heard about them or seen the thumbnail at some point. They have apparently been around for thousands of years, but there's no sign of agriculture or even fire. Yet still, this tribe has somehow continued to thrive. If we try and get close, they will attack us. After the 2004 tsunami, the Indian Coast Guard flew over to check on the island, make sure everyone's okay. But once they flew too close, the tribe attacked with arrows. So they could not land, obviously, but what if you arrived by boat? What would happen? Well also bad. Back in 2006, two fishermen lost their lives because they got too close to the island without knowing who was on it. The Sentinelese have lived here for around 60,000 years, and I don't think they're going anywhere anytime soon. Number seven, Niwa Island. Located in Hawaii, Niwa Island is quite small, and its population as well is pretty minimal, but why? 
Where is everyone? This is a beautiful island. Why wouldn't you want to live here? Why do only 170 people live on arguably one of the most beautiful islands in the world? Niwa Island has also been referred to as the Forbidden Island, hence why we're including it on our list here today. It was bought back in 1864 by Elizabeth Sinclair and it's been privately owned since then. So no one knows what's going on, hence the small population. The thing is though, in 1952, the polio epidemic hit the islands and a ban was then put in place permanently. You couldn't leave or enter the island. That's it. Locked down to the extreme. Like an island locked down, that'd be so scary. Nobody got sick, but now if you want to enter the island, you need to gain special access, which is a lot harder than it may seem. Absolutely no tourists or outsiders allowed. Period. It was sold by Hawaii's king Kamakamaha back in 1863 to the Robinson family, but as of 1915, no outsiders, again, are still allowed in. Some island cult behavior is going on here, I don't know. Whoever lives here does so without plumbing, telephone lines, or Netflix. Impressive. Even today, the island is, of course, off bounds. The Coast Guard is always patrolling the island too as well. What do you think lies on Niwa Island? Top secret government stuff? Probably. Number six, Heard Island. Have you heard about this island? Heard Island? No? Well, listen up. Right in the middle of Antarctica and Australia, there is this island, Heard Island. The Australian government has made it illegal for anybody to visit it, so if you have some free time and a kayak and some suntan lotion, don't even think about it. Go the other way. You won't make it. So why is this island forbidden? Is this one full of deadly snakes? Maybe, honestly. The myth here surrounding Heard Island is that there's animals we don't even know exist living here. We got some secret hybrid animals. This sounds a lot like Jurassic Park so far. The island itself is quite unique geographically. See, Heard Island is home to two volcanoes as well as the tallest mountain in Australia. So there's plenty of space for hybrid animals to hide and be scary. I love the idea of animals getting their own island, honestly. We have, we have enough, I'd say. Time to give one or two back. Except for Snake Island, that one, we don't want that one. You can keep that one for sure. Number five, North Brother Island. Located right between Rikers Island and the Bronx, quietly tucked away on the East River, North Brother Island was once home to a hospital back in the 19th century. You may be thinking a hospital on an island, how inconvenient is this? What's going on? Riverside Hospital was available for patients suffering from yellow fever, smallpox, or tuberculosis. So it was a quarantine zone, essentially. The hospital has since been abandoned. It's now sitting there literally falling to pieces. And the island has been quite active, oddly. A body was found near the island recently. A steamship called the General Slocum crashed on the island. There's also a haunted lighthouse on this island. And they even have what's referred to as Coffin Corner on this island. Yeah, Coffin Corner. I'm all set. I'd rather explore the Bronx than explore this island, honestly. Number four, Robins Island. Okay, we have a forbidden island and it's not cursed. We have a nice one, dare I say, here we go. The privately owned Robinson Island is massive and beautiful. It's not made of lava or snakes, it's just sand and trees, just a good time. And best of all, no humans at all. The 435 acre island sits off the coast of New Suffolk, New York. Many names have come and go when it comes to island ownership here, but as of right now, it's forbidden and it's a nature preserve. I'm okay with that, we can stay away from that one. The owner now is a man named Louis Bacon. He has poured time and money into building the sanctuary and he fears that if anybody else gets involved, the whole thing will just fail. Honestly, considering our number one spot, he's got a point. Aside from that side quest that Mr. Bacon's pulling off, Robbins Island is also home to the largest population of turtles in the state. So don't worry, he's not completely alone. He's got a bunch of turtles. Number three, Diego Garcia Island. An island with an airport. Okay, there's gotta be something good here, right? Located in the Indian Ocean, Diego Garcia is perhaps one of the most bizarre on this list. Definitely interesting. The island was once a part of the United Kingdom, but in order to settle up a debt in the millions, the UK had to hand it over to the United States. Gee, I wonder what they did with it. Is it a turtle sanctuary? Is it a forbidden seed island part two, perhaps? What's the game plan here? What are we doing? Well, today Diego Garcia is a top secret military base. Hence the airport. Although it's forbidden to enter, there's over 600 buildings resting on this island, as well as thousands of military personnel, but again, nobody knows what the island is really hiding, or what it's being used for. Maybe this is where they're keeping the Winter Soldier. Could be. He could punch through anyone. You can punch 6,000 people easily. Number two, Paviglia Island. The small island of Paviglia has taken many, many lives. When the bubonic plague arrived in 1348, the island then became a quarantine colony, just like our one earlier. So if you had symptoms, you were sent to this island to, yeah. It was a sad reality, not a lot of solutions back then. Again, in 1630, the Black Death crept in and once again, the center of this island became a mass graveyard. All bad so far. The soil, they say, is 50% human remains at this point. So if you're looking to plant some haunted sunflowers, there you go. There's your soil, weirdo. Today the island is abandoned, rightfully so. It's closed off to both tourists and locals. Hey, now that things are opening up again, what do you say we head to Pavigli Island? Check out some bubonic plague history. No? We're good? All right, cool. 
We'll go to Niagara Falls. If its dark history doesn't scare you away, the ghost stories surrounding the island might. In the early 20th century, mentally ill patients were sent to this island, but the doctor that was responsible for curing them for all these treatments, he would actually try these bizarre, insane methods. Cruel methods, really. And the doctor himself ended up going mad, and he ended up jumping to his death from the bell tower. The bell tower no longer stands, but the soil is still 50% remains, so either way, ghosts or history, that's a no from me. I would rather go to Number one, Garbage Island. We must finish with this one, the largest island of them all, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Mmm, smells good, smells like the ocean and all the garbage we've thrown into it. It's located in the North Pacific subtropical gyre. There's basically four of these large systems just swirling ocean currents, and some of them are chock full of garbage. Pretty disturbing, right? I've heard of the garbage patch before, but I had no idea how large it really was. This trash island is three times the size of France. And if that's not big enough for you, it's twice the size of Texas. Someone's like, oh, now I get it. This island is man-made, obviously, and it continues to grow. But it's not all grim, however, for our number one spot. There is a team working on reducing that size. The environmental nonprofit Ocean Cleanup has removed around 65,000 pounds of trash. So maybe next time you see this, there'll be only nine islands. We're hoping. Starting off this countdown, we have Fukushima. Due to the Fukushima nuclear disaster, Japan is said to be one of the world's most radioactive places. In 2011, an earthquake triggered a tsunami that ended up flooding the nuclear power plant and knocking out emergency generators. The power plant survived the earthquake, but the tsunami was twice as powerful as the plant was designed to tolerate. It led to the plant's three reactors leaking radioactive materials everywhere. The material contaminated wastewater and leaked into the Pacific Ocean. As a result, this is considered the most severe nuclear accident since Chernobyl. To this day, people are still cleaning up the nuclear waste and contaminated water there. In fact, 1.25 million tons of radioactive water is currently being stored at Fukushima. What's scary is that next year they won't be able to store anymore, so they're looking at releasing it into the sea. Obviously, it will be treated first, but still, it won't be good for the marine life or the water. Moving on at number 9, we have the Dugway Proving Ground. Located in Utah, the Dugway Proving Ground is the main biological and chemical weapons testing site for the US Army. During 1949 to 1952, four major types of radiation weapons tests took place there. First, we got the cluster bombs. Cluster bombs weighed about a ton each and they were dropped from airplanes flying at 20,000 feet. They then would explode when they reached 800 feet above the ground, spreading radioactive particles everywhere. These tests released between 1,500 to 30,000 curries of radiation each. Then we have the small pellet tests. Again, this involved dropping small radioactive pellets over the area from a high altitude. Then we have the radioactive specks. Basically, a dust generator would fly over the area and spew radioactive specks all over that area. They also tested exploding radioactive metal in different shapes to see what would spread the contamination the best. Each test released about 100 curries of radiation. In our 8 spot today, we have the abandoned hospital in Brazil. Now we'll be talking about an abandoned hospital site in Brazil that used to perform radiation therapy for cancer patients. On September 13th in 1987, a bunch of individuals broke into the abandoned hospital and stole some parts from a teletherapy unit, thinking it would be worth some money. Little did they know that they took home something highly radioactive. That night, upon bringing it home, the two men became very sick and threw up. In the following days, the two men became worse and worse. One of the men actually had his hand swell and he had to get it partially amputated. Little did they know what was causing this. While this was all happening, they gave this radioactive piece of equipment to a number of different people. In fact, one of the guys even dismantled it, spreading cesium all over a large area. In the end, four people died as a result of this incident and 250 others were injured from exposure to radioactive contamination. A cleanup crew was sent to decontaminate the area. Topsoil was removed in several areas and a number of houses were demolished. To this day, it's said to be one of the world's worst nuclear disasters and one of the world's worst radiological incident. In our seventh spot, we have Hanford Site. Located in Washington, D.C., the Hanford Site is said to be one of the world's most radioactive places. So during the Cold War, the U.S. used this site as its main plutonium production facility for their nuclear weapons. In the end, they produced enough plutonium for around 60,000 nuclear weapons, including the plutonium that was used in the Fat Man bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. Now this place has since been decommissioned, but still contains about 60 
60% of high level radioactive waste. Most of the waste has been buried underground, but that wasn't a good decision because large areas of groundwater have since become contaminated. Coming in at number 6 we have D'Abervilliers, Paris. During the 1920s to 1930s, two individuals, Frederick and Irene Joliet Curry, conducted a number of studies on radioactivity in this area. In particular, they were experimenting with salts of radium 226. Later on, the French army took over these experiments, and they seriously contaminated the fort. In the 1990s, 61 barrels of cesium-137 and radium-226 were found stored there, as well as about 160,000 gallons of contaminated soil. Over the years, they have tried to decontaminate the area, but in 2006, more contaminated areas were uncovered. People in the area were being exposed to radioactivity and they didn't even know it. In fact, a high percentage of people living in the surrounding area were found to have cancer. Although they deny that this site has anything to do with it, it seems quite obvious that it does. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Anawi Talk Island. This island is part of the Marshall Islands in the Pacific Ocean. In 1946 up until 1958, the US government conducted 67 nuclear tests in the Marshall Islands. In 1951, the first ever hydrogen bomb was tested there. As a result, a number of atolls got contaminated, including Anawi Talk. In fact, it's said that the Marshall Islands to this day are still more radioactive than Chernobyl and Fukushima. Isn't that insane? So when testing the soil, researchers found that the island had toxic levels 10 to 1000 times higher than the soil in Fukushima. And it's about 10 times more toxic than the soil found in Chernobyl. On top of that, the government said that this is a cause for great concern. The US government had to relocate an entire population because it was exposing them to cancer and other illnesses due to the radiation. But people still live there despite this huge concern. In 1980, hundreds of people gathered on this island and participated in a radioactive cleanup. But still, the levels on this island are highly unsafe. Coming in at number 4 we have Ronglap Atoll. Surprise surprise, another dangerously radioactive atoll located on the Marshall Islands. Researchers have found that this island has the highest levels of external gamma radiation than all of the islands they examined in the study. Soil samples from the area also expose that they have high concentrations of radioactive isotopes. Not only that, but researchers also found that the fruits on the islands contained more cesium-137 than is permitted by safety standards. And some of the islands also contained more cesium-137 than Chernobyl ever had. In our third spot today, we have Sellafield, United Kingdom. This is another place that has been given the name one of the world's most radioactive places. Back in the day during the Cold War, Sellafield was the site where weapon grade nuclear materials were produced for the UK's nuclear weapon program. However, in 1957, one of the wind scale pipes caught on fire and 11 tons of uranium was on fire for three days. As a result, radioactive material started spreading across the Lake District. It was deemed Britain's worst nuclear accident. On top of that, no one evacuated and no one received iodine pills. In fact, some people didn't even know about the fire. They tried to keep it all hush hush. And workers were just told to keep on working. That was until they found that golf courses, milk, and chickens, among other things, were getting contaminated. To this day, the plant releases around 2.3 million gallons of contaminated waste into the sea on a daily basis. In fact, this has made the Irish Sea the most radioactive sea in the world. Moving on to number two, we have the Siberian Chemical Combine. This is another place contaminated by high levels of radiation. Located in Russia, this was one of the production facilities used to produce nuclear products for the Soviet nuclear weapons program. But after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, the facility stopped its production of plutonium and uranium. But to this day, this combine keeps on contaminating underground waters. This has to do with the explosion that took place on April 6, 1993. As a result of the explosion, tens of thousands of people were exposed to high levels of radiation and contaminated air, water, and soil. In fact, it's said that 10 grams of plutonium is released into the atmosphere there each year. In 2008, a study of the area found increased levels of plutonium and cesium-137 in soils and water samples, suggesting the plant is still leaking. And in our number one spot today, we have the Bikini Atoll. This is another atoll located in the Marshall Islands. Turns out that depending on how long you stay there, you could get exposed to as much radiation as you would get from 1 to 64 chest x-rays. That's insane. So in 1954, this area was the site for the US's largest hydrogen bomb test. The blast from this bomb was thousands of times more powerful as the bombs dropped on Japan during World War II. As a result, Bikini Island is said to have the highest 
highest levels of radiation in all of the Marshall Islands. In fact, in 1946, residents were forced to relocate. So they were actually shipped around to a number of different islands. They kept moving these people around because of lack of water and food sources. Then in the 1960s, the government said that the islands were safe to live on again and they were no longer radioactive, which was not the case. And they soon found the levels of radiation were still dangerously high, so everyone had to leave again. In fact, this location is said to be more radioactive than Chernobyl and Fukushima. In our number 10 spot, we have Hanford, USA. In the 1940s, the US, along with the rest of the world, was in the midst of World War II, and it became important to rush to develop a nuclear weapon before the opposing side did first. American scientists rushed to develop the nuclear weapon in a project known as the Manhattan Project. Within this project, the town of Hanford was chosen to house a plant that would make the plutonium, and this is where the nuclear device would be created. In the process, the plant made a large amount of radioactive elements. Some say made over 60,000 nuclear weapons, and of course, that left a massive amount of radioactive waste. Even though some effort has been made to contain the waste, the area is still considered radioactive, and there have been many cases of cancer from around the area. In our number nine spot, we have the Siberian Chemical Combine in Russia. The Siberian Chemical Combine was founded in 1949 and it extremely helped the Soviet Union's weapons program. The factory made plutonium and highly enriched uranium, everything needed to produce nuclear devices. Production began to decrease as the Cold War ended and eventually it shut down in 2008. Although closed, it has become a sort of storage unit for toxic chemicals and radioactive waste. Apparently some of the containers are even leaking radioactive waste, approximately 113,000 metric tons. This is definitely not a safe place and you are forbidden from visiting it. In our number 8 spot we have Mylusu, Kyrgyzstan. Apparently Mylusu was rich in uranium used in nuclear weapons and that is why the Soviet Union created a mining facility there. Supposedly toxic waste was buried in the area that was mined. This area was heavily mined and so so therefore there was quite a lot of toxic waste disposed and put in the excavated areas. Apparently because of this, the area around the mine is known to have earth tremors which are believed to be because of the buried waste. Yikes. Definitely a place you want to stay away from. In our number 7 spot we have Sellafield, UK. This one is a super sad story and I cannot believe that I never knew about this as my mom is actually from a town pretty close to Sellafield. Basically there was a nuclear plant in the town that would produce a large quantity of plutonium. The plant unfortunately would release its radioactive waste into the sea daily and it is said that at one point it was releasing as high as 8 million liters daily. There was a massive fire in 1957 and radioactive fumes went into the atmosphere. It was one of the biggest nuclear disasters and thousands of people developed respiratory problems from breathing in the air. Many animals in the sea also died due to the waste in the water. The area has had a lot of cleanup, but I would still be weary of going there today. In our number 6 spot we have Goiás, Brazil. In Goiás, Brazil, 1987, there was an abandoned hospital that was broken into and the robbers became attracted to a glowing, shining material. They carried it along with a machine, and little did they know that it was a cancer therapy device. They called many people, friends and family, and their family's friends, to look at the device. When many of them began to get sick, four died and 250 were admitted into the hospital before the government stepped in, but at that point, radioactive particles spread across this area, and some believe it to still be contaminated today. Lesson here? Do not steal, folks. In our number five spot, we have the Polygon, Kazakhstan. During the Cold War, the Polygon was used as a test site for nuclear weapons. So as you can imagine, it might have a bit of radioactive waste within it. Maybe just a bit. Approximately 400 nuclear weapons were tested here during the time the site was active. Apparently over 200,000 people have had adverse effects from being near the site and being exposed to the radioactivity. In the last while though, the area has become restricted so nobody is allowed to visit it. And why would you want to? Why risk potentially getting sick? 
In our number four spot, we have the Somali coastline. There are no nuclear plants in Somalia, but allegedly in the 80s, an Italian company sunk 30 ships loaded with nuclear waste in the Somali coastline, and that is how it came to be such a radioactive place. A large dump like this would make it almost impossible for the coastline to ever recover. Apparently, at the time, the government was not monitoring the activity along the coastline, and that is how this came to happen. The Swiss apparently were doing this as well. Man, I hope Italy and Switzerland gave the country some reparations or something for destroying their coastline and also making that area uninhabitable. In our number three spot, we have Mayak, Russia. Another radioactive place that you should definitely not try to visit, although you wouldn't be allowed to anyway. There were many nuclear accidents and spills that took place at Mayak. More than 15,000 kilometers were contaminated with radioactive waste. The plant suffered a a horrible disaster in 1957 where about 200 people died and at least 270,000 were evacuated. Because of this incident, this site is considered one of the most dangerous radioactive places in the world. There were attempts at cleaning up the waste, but apparently the area is still very, very heavily contaminated. In our number two spot, we have Fukushima, Japan. In 2011, there was a massive earthquake and tsunami that hit Japan and its Pacific coast, and it caused a horrible disaster for the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. There was a nuclear meltdown as the backup generator that was created in case of a natural disaster failed to work. Apparently hydrogen air exploded and this caused a fire and three active reactors leaked radioactive material. This then led to a spillover by the pool that was being used to store contaminated wastewater and that led to the contamination of the whole coast. 154,000 people were evacuated from the site. The site is still heavily contaminated today and is heavily avoided. In our number one spot, we have Chernobyl, Ukraine. Arguably one of the worst nuclear disasters ever, Chernobyl is not a place you want to go anywhere near and you wouldn't be able to anyway. The plant is permanently closed. In 1986, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant was in a massive fire that occurred after a malfunction during a safety check. There were allegedly flaws in the design of the reactor and as the safety systems were shut down, this led to overheating that generated steam that was uncontrolled and that is what created an open air graphite fire that sent radioactive fumes into the atmosphere. That must have been horrific to see. A hundred deaths were associated directly with the incident, but since over six million people were exposed, there have been varying estimates of the amount. It's hard to know based on increased mortality due to disease that could be associated with the accident. Kicking off the list at number 10. 10, Doramad Toothpaste. With charcoal toothpaste being more popular nowadays, we have to kick this list off with possibly the worst toothpaste to ever exist. Doramad. Accelerate your breath. Gross. Yeah, so back in the 40s, people were brushing with radiation. Even on the actual tube, it says its radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. The cells are loaded with new life energy and the bacteria is therefore hindered in their destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant, mildly refreshing taste. Yummy. Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but the fact that this once existed, compared to what you're about to hear on this list, is so wild to me. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. Who knew? Number nine, radioactive water. Ah, nothing quenches your thirst more than some radium water. And you thought Dasani tastes bad, buckle up. Back in 1932, Evan Byers, 51 year old steel manufacturer and golf pro, met his fate in a horrible way. He was told to drink this product by his physiotherapist. He said that drinking this product would help the golfer's arm pain and fatigue. Each of these bottles contained one microgram of radium and one microgram of isothorium mixed with water. The guy would drink radiation after every single meal and subsequently he lost weight and developed bone necrosis in his jaw. He lost several teeth before his jaw literally fell apart. Number eight. Thoradia. If somebody told you your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest compliment of all time. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, powders, lipstick, anything to get your glam on, really. They took pride in using thorium and radium lead to tone facial tissues, remove wrinkles, and all that jazz. And the product was doing so well it actually circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, and France. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these side effects. So the radium would literally make your skin glow a bit, which is great, but then after you 
you know, might die in the long-term effects. I'm glad this didn't stick around. Imagine Jennifer Aniston using this. It's kind of hard to do a Friends reboot without a jaw. Mm. Number seven, toys. This holiday season, here's a fun playset to absolutely avoid. The Gilbert U238 Atomic Energy Lab toy set sounds fun, I guess, when you say it out loud, and it looks quite fun upon first glance, but when the company released this kit back in 1950, it was all but games. Gilbert, who was a successful toy maker, businessman, even magician, believed that his line of work should be fun, yet informative. He was nicknamed the man who saved Christmas after he convinced the US Council of National Defense to not ban toy purchases during World War I around the holiday season. He was a big deal, and he meant well. This set was around $50, which back in the day was actually quite a lot. The price was justified, apparently, as the set was, well, actually radioactive. And that wasn't even the reason it had been discontinued, believe it or not. They actually stopped making them because they were just too expensive. Now, the Atomic Energy Lab contained this cloud chamber where you can actually see alpha particles traveling at 12,000 miles a second. Imagine asking for a light bright and then you open this. I'd rather find coal. I think I'd rather find coal. Number six. Watches. New Jersey 1916. When a factory opened its doors and hired 70 women, the first employees out of a thousand, it was considered a well paid job. This was a big deal. The job was simple and some would say artistic. These women would apply small amounts of radiated paint to these tiny dials so you could see the time, day or night. They were told to point the brushes with their lips, and if you're already sensing a pattern here, things are about to get a whole lot worse for these ladies. Later known as the Radium Girls, it took years for these long-term side effects to take place. The company told the girls that the paint was harmless. Of course they did. These poor ladies were literally poisoning themselves on the clock. Now eventually these women started to suffer from burns, ulcers, and horrible aches with their jawbones too, starting to dissolve. This is extremely sad, and a side effect from working here was that all this radioactive dust would fill the air. So these ladies loved their job. They actually wore their good dresses to work in hopes that it would maintain this radioactive shine when they got home. Horrible. Number five, the Trico system. Instead of plucking your eyebrows before prom, if it was still the 1920s, you would ideally want to use the Trico system to remove those unwanted hairs. This device was booming in the 20s. Hair salons had to have this thing. By 1925, there were over 75 systems installed in beauty shops, and what you would do is sit at this large desk, face this small window for a few minutes, and then boom, you're beautiful. Just like that, after 20 treatments of this. It's not that fast of a system. But then you'd be beautiful, so I mean, I guess 20 visits, Makes sense. They used x-ray technology on their faces way back in the day. So in 1929, trigo problems were on the rise. Ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death. This was not the solution you wanted. Just do this, just pluck, pluck everything. Even get some tape, scotch tape, anything's better than that. Don't do that. Number four, fluoroscope. Overpronation, low arches, a little bit of radiation, Dr. Scholes can certainly help with that. A proper measurement of the foot is the first step to a healthier lifestyle. If you're off by a half size in either width or length, you're setting yourself up for future problems. I worked at New Balance, trust me, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so when x-rays started being used to properly measure up the family foot sizes in stores, it sounded like an ideal start to an otherwise exhausting process. This began in the 1920s and everybody used these things. Adult, kids, it didn't even matter. It was completely normal. By the time the 40s rolled around, scientists were concerned about the radiation level emitting off of these machines. Eventually, and thankfully, they were banned. The little thing we use today is so annoying, like with the it's always so cold too when you're measuring your foot. You're like, ah, 11, I'm 11, stop. Also wrong foot. Number three, chocolate. Halloween is right around the corner, so what better time to mention the spookiest chocolate of all time? Burke and Bronze Radium Chocolate. Doesn't that sound appetizing off the bat? Mm. These delights were sold between 1931 to 1936, and it was praised for the effect that it had on consumers. Instead of getting a tummy ache after downing some of Burke and Bronze chocolate, you would feel rejuvenated. Nice. The chocolate was made in that radium water that I mentioned earlier with the golfer and the arm stuff. So you know it's gonna be bad news real soon. Of course, as time went on, these horror stories started to get out. Folks decided, you know what? Maybe eating radium chocolate wasn't a good idea. Who knew? Besides, mini eggs are also way better. I'll eat a thousand of those and definitely feel rejuvenated. That's for sure. Number two, antiques. So we heard the horrors that came to be after the radium gals were told that it was safe to lick radiated paintbrush, which is a horrible idea. So when we talk about clocks or other antiques, the same concerns come to mind. 
We needed a way to tell the time in the dark, be it on a wristwatch or in our homes. And back then, we didn't know how to do it without these radioactive materials. When radium was first discovered in the early 1900s, its natural glow was used in many more ways. During World War II, for example, radium dials were used to allow pilots to fly at night without using bright cockpit lights. It's like when you're driving and you turn on the light and your dad's like, oh my god! We have to avoid that, you know, we have glow in the dark dials instead of clicking things and crashing. Uranium was also used to give jewelry those yellow, green, or orange colors. And for many years, glassmakers used a very small amount of uranium to make their glass green or yellow, which is wild to me because radiation or not, those aren't flattering colors. Have some company over, you're like, oh, let me just grab my Mountain Dew stained wine glass. Here you go, ma'am. Cheers. And finally, number one. Vita Radium Suppositories. With guaranteed real radium, yes, the home product company of Denver, Colorado, that's next to Colorado, it has a V, they're cooler. With guaranteed real radium, the home product company of Denver, Colorado came out with these suppositories back in 1930, and the way that they marketed these things, let me just read it out to you. It's just utterly insane to look back on. The company reached out and it says, weak discouraged men. Yes, if you are showing signs of slowing up in your actions and duties, perhaps if you have begun to lose your charm, your personality, your normal manly vigor, then certainly you want to stage a comeback. The man who had lost these precious attributes of youth knows how to appreciate their value. He realizes that happiness depends on his ability to perform the duties of a real man. Sweet glorious pleasures of life. Nature intended that you should enjoy them, and now is the time to act. Then they put radiation right up their that's the, that's the plan. The initial goal here was to, of course, feel better, but instead of waking up a new man feeling refreshed, users eventually stopped waking up in general. Also, what an insane marketing ad. They're like, hey, are you a real man? Radiation, come check it out. Coming in first in our number 10 spot are abandoned dolls. So if you guys have ever seen one of my videos before, then you might already know I have a specific disdain for creepy dolls. And wouldn't you know it, the exclusion zone is said to be filled with broken and abandoned dolls at every turn. Apparently the specific area is Pripyat, and those that have visited report seeing things like baby dolls sitting in abandoned hospitals, creepy dolls sitting on windowsills propped up up on skeletal bed frames sprawled out in piles of debris, and the most creepy of all, wearing a gas mask. Now, to be fair, there is a high possibility that while many of these toys are remnants from the actual disaster, there's definitely some tourism interference. But interference or not, many still believe the dolls are haunted. In fact, some visitors swear they've seen the dolls watch them as they walk along the grounds. So whether you are afraid of creepy evil dolls or not, broken dolls without limbs sitting in the middle of a nuclear ghost town is one of my worst nightmares. Coming in at number nine, a natural earthquake. Okay, so I'll start off by saying this might not fully be a creepy encounter, but it's definitely a strange little piece of the puzzle that I had never heard about until now. Apparently back in 1996, there had been a study to explore the possibility of an earthquake being a partial reason for the explosion of Reactor 4. However, experts quickly revealed that port had over 80 discrepancies, and so it was kind of thrown out as a theory. But the following year, in 1997, a separate group of scientists from the United Institute of the Physics of the Earth decided to revisit the study and they came to an interesting conclusion. So as they reported, the night of April 25th, 1986, which was the night prior to the disaster, three nearby geological stations recorded a relatively weak seismic event. Now, normally this probably wouldn't be cause for concern, but according to the study, the earthquake, albeit small, is thought to have occurred a mere 16 seconds prior to the explosion and could have potentially caused an issue with the proper insertion of the graphite rods designed to protect the reactor as the facility lacked proper protection from seismic movement. I mean, if nothing else, it's definitely a strange little coincidence. Coming in at number eight, weaponized earthquake. Speaking of earthquakes, inside the Chernobyl exclusion zone, there is apparently also some evidence 
evidence that tectonic weapons were being researched and developed in the Soviet Union at the time. Now, to be clear, it's not known if these weapons were actually ever deployed, but there are some theories out there that suggest that a weaponized earthquake might not be as far-fetched as it sounds. On May 30th, 1992, Pravda, which was the former official newspaper of the Soviet Union, reported that a geophysical or tectonic weapon was actually developed in the USSR despite the UN convention. Pravda, which was the former official newspaper of the Soviet Union, reported that a geophysical or tectonic weapon was actually developed in the USSR despite the UN convention. Now, of course, many higher-ups denied this, but some are sure that they saw it with their own eyes. I mean, it is an interesting theory and definitely makes you wonder what could have been going on behind closed doors. Coming in at number seven, faked photography. So believe it or not, Chernobyl is actually a pretty big tourist destination spot. And along with any tourist destination comes many, many photos. Now, there are some pretty famous photos that we associate with the abandoned area. However, according to photographer Darman Richter, a lot of these photos we see aren't actually authentic, but rather a facade created to make money off those who love dark tourism. Richter, who visited Pripyat for his own photography said the city was desolate in many ways and still very dangerous. However, a lot of the chilling photos that have become famous online have been manufactured by photographers looking to create the perfect horror shot. Quote, I observed countless instances of tourists moving these artifacts around or repositioning furniture for a better shot. He then says, quote, I watched a photographer arrange stuffed bears and little dolls so that they sat in line along the edge of a bare metal frame bed. I mean, it's no secret that we live in a very curated world where everyone is posting their best moments, but something about trying to curate a disaster zone is definitely a very strange thing to think about. Coming in at number six, immortality seekers. On a little island in Greece called Gavdos, there is an unsuspecting group of seven Russian scientists who have created a commune and set out for the impossible, immortality. Apparently their founder, Andre, had been exposed to high amounts of radiation after a voluntary trip to Chernobyl shortly after the blast. Andre was, of course, advised to go to a clinic in Moscow for treatment. However, believing it was a lost cause, he apparently decided to settle in a small village and live out the rest of his life there. But this is where it gets a little strange. He lived. Now, this is sort of a conspiracy theory, I will admit. However, there are many that believe the scientists chose Gavdos in an attempt to seize control of the Earth and become immortal. The scientists created a tight-knit relationship with the church, and according to a documentary that was being created about the community, quote, they feel they need to reconstruct the world and implement the birth of a new immortal human. Apparently, the scientists even began building a Greek temple where they aim to revive Pythagoras philosophy and unearth forgotten Greek mysteries. All of which is said to be in the pursuit of immortality. Which, okay, I know it's all a little far-fetched, but I mean, if it turns out to be true, it would definitely be creepy. Coming in at number five, Bible predictions. There are a ton of wild predictions out there, and I'll leave it up to you to decide whether or not you think that prophets and seers really do see into the future or not. That being said, there are some out there that believe the Chernobyl disaster was actually predicted in the Bible. According to the book of Revelations, quote, and the third angel sounded the trumpet and a great star fell from heaven, burning as it were a torch, and it fell on the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, at first you're probably wondering, what on earth could that have to do with Chernobyl? Well, apparently in Russian, Chernobyl is said to mean wormwood. Now, could this be a coincidence? Sure, but it is definitely a bit strange. On top of that, the fires from reactor four have been likened to a torch, and it's believed the third trumpet referred to the accident itself, while the bitter water had to do with radiation. So what do you think? Was disaster predicted in the Bible? Coming in at number four, mutated farm animals. 
first it might sound like something from a science fiction novel, but according to Thought Co, just after the disaster, and again in 1989 to 1990, there was a huge spike in malformed farm animals. Many believe this phenomenon coincides with a failure of the sarcophagus, which was a concrete tomb that crews built around the failed reactor in the hope that it would stop leaking radiation or producing deformed farm animals. Which as we know now, didn't quite work out as hoped. Among the mutations seen in the local cattle, pigs, goats, and horses born in the area after the disaster, some suffered from intensely messed up faces, extra limbs, dwarfism, or unnatural colors. In fact, one tiny little piglet became a well-known victim of the radiation. The poor little thing suffered from a mutation called dipgus, which is when they have duplicated lower limbs, and it uh, is definitely not a great sight, I will say that much. I mean, I love little piglets, but this one is definitely giving off more of a creepy horror movie vibe. That being said, you don't need to take my word for it. If you like, you can actually see it for yourself, as it is apparently on display at the Ukrainian National Chernobyl Museum. Coming in at number three, graffiti. While you might think that most people would try to stay as far away as possible from nuclear disaster zones, there are a ton of people that sneak into the exclusion zone all the time. In particular, a group of graffiti artists who left behind some eerie art all over Pripyat. Painted to appear as permanent shadows, assumingly like the actual ones left on the buildings in Hiroshima after their respective nuclear attack, creepy black silhouettes adorn the abandoned city creeping out everyone who sees them. In one room, a little girl with bows in her pigtails reaches for a light switch, while outside, a boy pulls a toy truck toward the corner of a building. On other walls, the figures appear to dance, and in a separate section, three young people are jumping, or as some speculate, floating, holding on to each other in terror. Those that have seen them in person say they are incredibly eerie and haunting, and some have even ventured to say that the spirits of the lost souls could live inside the walls, haunting the tourists who walk past. Coming in at number two, aliens. There are definitely tons of theories surrounding alien involvement in the Chernobyl disaster. And while most theories are actually on the more positive side, with witnesses claiming they saw aliens stopping the disaster from getting worse, one witness, Mikhail Varitsky, had a slightly different experience. Quote, I and other people from my team went to the site of the blast at night. We saw a ball of fire and it was slowly flying in the sky. I think the the ball was six or eight meters in diameter. Then we saw two rays of crimson light stretching towards the fourth unit. The object was some 300 meters from the reactor. The event lasted for about three minutes. The lights of the object went out and it flew away in the northwestern direction. Now the question here is, was the alien a part of the other group that people say were here to save the planet? Or were they some kind of rival that was interfering and making matters worse. I mean, honestly, I haven't one sweet clue, but any alleged UFO site is spooky in my books. And last up today in our number one spot, the ghosts. Considering that Chernobyl was the location of many deaths, it's not a huge shock that many claim to have witnessed ghosts roaming around the abandoned grounds. But one story in particular really sent shivers down my spine. Andrei Karsakov, a nuclear physicist, was visiting the area back in 1997 and says one morning he arrived at 7.30 and headed over to the number four reactor sarcophagus to measure radiation, where the infamous explosion had occurred. Obviously, he was not allowed inside due to the radiation, but as he was taking readings of the radiation from outside, he says he began hearing someone screaming for help from the inside. Quote, I ran upstairs to tell someone, but they said that when I entered the reactor control room, I was the first person to open that door in three years. And the only way to get inside the old reactor is through the doors I came in through. If someone had gone inside 
inside the reactor when I was not looking, they would have tripped an alarm that goes off when the reactor door is opened mechanically. He went on to explain that the reactor door also requires a password and a handprint, yet he swore he heard someone screaming for help. Then later that evening, as they were eating, he noticed a floodlight turn on, which should have been impossible since there was no way anyone could be inside. Apparently his colleague tried to ease his suspicions by saying it could have been a power surge, but just as his colleague said that, the light snapped off, as if someone was inside listening to their conversation the whole time. Number 10, Vita Radium Suppositories. Yeah. What I've discovered while making this list is that after radium was discovered, people became obsessed with it. Like the GMA and Frank's Red Hot commercials, they put that on everything. Vita radium suppositories were developed as a way of relieving our digestive systems a la radioactive material. According to this ad, these suppositories were guaranteed, guaranteed to contain radium, which is exactly the opposite of what we want to see on the back of canisters today. People believe that radium had miracle effects when it came to the human body, saying that they made you glow because they did. These pills were to be inserted into the rectum so they could be dissolved and devoured by the entire body. According to the ad, and I quote, every tissue, every organ of the body is bombarded by its health giving electric atoms. They also implied that it would increase libido. Oh wow. But the only thing that rose to the expectation was the death toll. Number nine, radioactive toy set. Gilbert U238 Atomic Energy Lab was the hottest thing to hit toy stores in the 1950s for a hefty price. The toy set cost was $50 because it was actually radioactive. $50 was a steep price to pay back then. Meanwhile, I can spend that in like a day living here. So fortunately, a lot of parents bought more affordable science sets that didn't have radioactive stuff. The toy as a result was discontinued, not because it was actually poisonous, but because no one could afford it. Some say it was safe for children to use as it was very carefully constructed, but you know, put it in the hands of like a nine year old boy. <laughs> Iffy. The Atomic Energy Lab contained a cloud chamber in which you could see alpha particles traveling at 12,000 miles a second. That would be pretty cool. Like, if I was that kid and I didn't know what was going on, I totally would be like, Mom, I want that for Christmas. I would have a blast. Pretty impressive, but definitely something rated for kids like 40 and up with, a, with maybe a science degree and like a lab suit. Number eight, Perpetual Sunshine. And no, that's not my nickname, but if you wanna call me that, go for it. Wouldn't it be cool if we all glowed like Alina in Shadow and Bone? Yeah, it definitely would. But like, if someone offers you any kind of radioactive substance, like run, get out of here. Radithor was yet another cure-all remedy said to cure everything under the sun, the deadliest snake oil out there. But I should say, we do use radiation today for things like cancer, but we know more or less what we're doing with it now. Radithor was a patent medicine that featured distilled water and two isotopes of radium. Perpetual sunshine in a bottle is what advertisers called it. And it was one of many radioactive elixirs on the market, but sadly, the more a star glows, the faster it burns out. A popular Radiothor advocate in 1932 eventually developed holes in his bones, skull, and his entire jaw had to be removed. Still, the man sadly died due to radiation poisoning, so not the miracle cure people thought it was. Unless you didn't like him, that's dark. <laughs> That's very dark. Uh, okay. Number seven, Faux Radia. From cancerous white face powder to radioactive cream, beauty really does kill. I wonder how much of my makeup on my face um, is slowly killing me. Joke, not a joke. I don't know. Uh. Faux Radia was another deadly beauty product introduced by a Parisian beauty company that was all the rage. It boasted having thorium and radium lead to help stabilize and promote blood circulation, tone the facial tissues, eliminate fat and remove wrinkles. Product toured Belgium, Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, and of course, France. Radium's energy was useful as far as creating a natural luminous appearance, but in 1937, the French government put a massive restriction on the sale of products that contained thorium and radium, forcing them to stop using the ingredients. Like, it was almost as if the government was catching on to some not so dewy glow side effects. Beyond cosmetic, the cream was also recommended for scrapes, bruises, herpes, frostbite, you name it. Some clients might not have seen the effects of these chemicals right away, but their later ailments definitely had a relationship to the miracle cure makeup. 
Number six, radioactive shoe sizers. Why use a measuring tape or those like cool metal feet slidey things when you can just use a nuclear bomb? Okay, well not a nuclear bomb, more like a whole bunch of radioactive materials. I'm honestly just as surprised as you are. I had no idea we were this obsessed with radium for this long. The shoe fitting fluoroscope was a revolutionary new device that changed the way people have their feet measured because apparently rulers didn't work. Despite scientists getting severely injured during the creation of the device, shoe stores adored it. Parents would take their growing little boys and girls to the counter to have their feet scientifically sized. They put their feet into the x-ray fluoroscope and the salesman and customer would see the bones in their foot. The customers also got a healthy dose of radiation. What a deal. Fortunately though, by the 1950s, these machines were recognized as dangerous and slowly banned state by state until 1970s, though Europe continued to use them because they're chic. But decades before bans came into question, the dangers of radiation were already public. In the 1920s, x-ray pioneers suffered very gruesome and very public deaths. Actual data didn't appear until the 1940s and nobody listened until the aforementioned date. But hey, at least they knew they were a size 7.56 over a 7.5 shoe. That's helpful. Number five, radioactive toothpaste. Everyone wants to have a smile that lights up a room. Yeah. Radioactive toothpaste, a joy for dentists around the world. So we know by now that people freak out at radium for breakfast because they were convinced it could cure everything, even bad yellow teeth. A German company called Our Company wanted to get out of the steadily building war business. So they came out with thorium toothpaste in order to divert their supplies away from the Yahtzee, evil German people. Nuclear initiatives, especially after they knew Germany was going to lose the war. Marketed as the scientific toothpaste, they advertised that the radioactive chemicals will be able to hinder the bacteria in the mouth, which I guess would be technically true, therefore creating healthier teeth. But unfortunately, the opposite was true. Like rotting away. It was awful. Number four, the trico system. Look. I hate waxing too. I hate it. I've tried it twice and to this day I refuse to put myself through that kind of pain for a bikini pic. Look, I'm just not going to do it. It's the worst. I get it. It's a struggle. A struggle. The trico system was eager to solve and it did. Kind of. The trico system was a hair removal device that became a must have in every hair salon in the 1920s. It would remove hair painlessly. All you had to do was sit at a mahogany desk and face a window. When the flip was switched there was no burning. Just a slight hum from the the machine and boom, no unwanted hairs. Except there were some horrendous side effects. Yes, it would remove the hair, but soon women and men would develop cancerous ulcers, carcinoma, and death. The reason they were using x ray technology, which is, as we know, radioactive. It would be administered to the skin for a few times and would require anywhere from 15 to 20 treatments to be effective. When the trico machine was leased out, however, there was no mention of what the technology they used was, and the person administering it wasn't very well qualified either, right? Clients were just marveled that it worked so well until it slowly burned their face off. So, bottom line, if someone says anything is a miracle cure, just uh, maybe like, scream at them and run. Number three, the radium girls. This story breaks my heart, it's so sad. Uh, the radium girls became so radioactive that if you stand on their graves today with a Geiger counter, it will still jump like 80 years later. Small town girls from New Jersey were hired by a local factory to paint clock faces of luminous watches. How did they glow you ask? Well, with glow in the dark radioactive paint. They painted 250 dials on average daily and in order to ensure that their lines were clean, they would lick the end before dipping it into the paint every few times. They were paid in pennies, around 27 cents per watch today. That, that's what it kind of breaks down to. So they worked tirelessly, each day swallowing more and more paint. Slowly but surely, the girls were eaten from the inside, their bones dissolving with each stroke of their brush. In the 1920s, 4,000 workers were hired by the US and Canada. The inventor of the glow in the dark paint himself died of radioactive exposure. The first death of the girls though was Molly Magia, died after suffering burning ulcers and agonizing aches, her jawbone dissolved, and so on. The USRC covered it up, saying they weren't responsible, until dozens more died via extreme tumors and horrific other illnesses resulting from the radium. Number two, Marie Curie. Marie Curie was a brilliant scientist, a pioneer in many ways for women in the field. Her primary accomplishment was expanding our knowledge of radioactivity. But they didn't take any of the precautions we now know to take today. In fact, Marie and her husband Pierre were both buried in lead caps 
caskets to contain the radiation they accumulated in their bodies while alive. Even their furniture was radioactive. Marie discovered two new elements, radium as I've mentioned and polonium and was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize. Using the new discovery of radium, Curie discovered it could be used as the gamma ray source in x-ray technology, advancing the field. She also invented smaller more portable x-rays that medics could use on the battlefields. However, the Curries overlooked what prolonged exposure to radiation could do. She even used to carry tubes of radium in her pockets. In the 1920s it finally caught up to her. Her health started to deteriorate rapidly and developed a severe form of leukemia. She passed away on July 4th, 1934. Pierre died years earlier in 1906 from an accident in the street. He was run over by a horse drawn cart. Because he was so young though, his body held on to more radioactive materials so his body was actually more radioactive by the end than Marie's was because by that point it would have run through. Interesting. but. Terrifying. And last but not least, you knew this was coming the atom bomb. Hands up if you think every world leader should get rid of their nuclear devices. But they won't, sadly, which is a terrifying thought. After all, no one buys a weapon without having a plan to use it. And if you look at the aftermath of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, well, one of us is going to be next. The bomb at Hiroshima destroyed two thirds of the city's building in a flash of light and killed 60,000 by the end of 1945. Some were killed directly, others years later due to their injuries. Decades later, survivors of the bombings were still pulling debris from beneath their skin, like little shards of glass, as well as enduring horrific medical conditions like cancer, kidney diseases. The list goes on. Three days after Hiroshima, they dropped another on Nagasaki. Today, the cities have found new life and would hardly be recognized after 75 years. However, the memories of what happened remain and how could they forget? Hibakusha is the term used for survivors of both Hiroshima and Nagasaki and many like Hiroshi Hirata take action for disarmament and advocate for world peace. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot we have the disaster. We talk a lot about Chernobyl but how often do we really discuss how this disaster actually happened in the first place? What actually went on that caused it? The Chernobyl nuclear disaster occurred on April 26th, 1986 in Ukraine, which at the time was a part of the Soviet Union. During a routine safety test, a series of errors and design flaws led to an explosion in Reactor 4 of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The explosion caused a massive fire that released radioactive material into the atmosphere, which was carried by wind across Ukraine, Belarus, and other parts of Europe. The disaster was caused by a combination of factors, including a flawed reactor design, a lack of safety, and human an error. During the safety test, the reactor's power output dropped to dangerously low levels, leading to an attempt to restore power that resulted in a sudden surge. This caused the reactor to overheat, leading to a steam explosion that destroyed the reactor's upper structure. The accident caused immediate deaths due to the explosion, as well as long-term health effects from exposure to radiation. The Chernobyl disaster remains the worst nuclear accident in history in terms of the number of deaths and the environmental impact. It led to significant changes in nuclear safety regulations and increased awareness of the potential risks of nuclear power. In our number 9 spot today we have The Operator. This story is one that comes directly from Alexei Brias, who is a control room operator at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant and this is his story of the day of the disaster which starts as he was traveling on a bus to work on April 26th, 1986, knowing nothing of the historic disaster that occurred just hours before. As he arrived he thought, quote, it looked like it would be a mass grave. I was sure that the whole night shift had died there. He continued on to say, quote, At the moment of the explosion, I was in Pripyat in my flat. I was sleeping tightly. I didn't hear. I didn't see anything. In the morning, I was to go to work, and so I did. I knew nothing about the disaster. I just got on a bus and went to work. As I was coming close to the station, I saw from the bus that the block was destroyed. I always say that my hair stood on its end when I saw that. I didn't understand why me and other workers were brought there, but it turned out that there was still much work to be done. Me and my co-workers got off the bus and tried to enter the territory of the fourth block as we were supposed to. There was a guard wearing a rubber coated army suit who had orders not to let anyone in. Finally, they agreed. The guarding sergeant gave us each a pill of potassium iodide. I took it immediately. It was a special medicine made to protect the thyroid gland from radiation. All my life, I remember him with gratitude. The upper part of the reactor and the separator barrel were open. The main circulating pump was seen from the outside. Down the reactor, I saw the reactor's emergency cooling system all ruined. Its pieces were mixed with slabs of concrete. I was stepping over lumps 
lumps of black graphite. I didn't want to admit what I saw, just like many other people, that it was black graphite. Alexei goes on to explain that he and the other operators had to quote, save those injured by fire, debris, hot water, and steam and radiation. We were to find them, carry them out, and deliver them to the medical personnel and go look for others. We saved and brought everybody out, except for one person. He is still somewhere there, inside the reactor. In our number eight spot today, you know, a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a break in the really dark story, we have cows. All right, cows can cheer anybody up. The area around Chernobyl was known for its agriculture before the disaster, so of course that means there were definitely a lot of cows that could be found. While many people who were forced to evacuate had to leave their animals behind, since farm animals are not only expensive, but can also be used as a source of income, many people took their farm animals with them. Unfortunately, however, many of these animals had already been exposed to the radiation in some capacity, and while it didn't affect them right away, the newer generations saw much more of the effects. In 1989, many farmers began reporting birth defects in their animals, some being much more severe than others. As time went on, the cows became less mutated, but that doesn't mean the effects went away. As the cows continued to graze on feed that was contaminated, the effects became more internal. This has led to completely normal looking cows near the exclusion zone to begin producing milk that is toxic and not fit for consumption. While some of the outside and more visible effects of the radiation has worn off, there are still many, many unseen effects that continue to be prevalent today. In our number 7 spot today, we have the liquidators. In the immediate aftermath of the disaster, Soviet authorities sent in robots to help with the cleanup efforts in the most hazardous areas. This was an amazing idea until the robots quickly became damaged or destroyed by the high levels of radiation in the environment. The robots faced several challenges, including damage to their electronic components and problems with their movement systems. The high levels of radiation also made it difficult for the robots to function, as the radiation would interfere with the robots' sensors and their controls. Of course, with robots out of the picture, humans were the ones who continued with the cleanup efforts. Known as liquidators, these people were primarily Soviet military personnel, firefighters, and volunteers who were tasked with containing the radioactive material and preventing further contamination, and they faced extreme danger and were exposed to high levels of radiation. Many of these people were working without proper protective gear and in close proximity to the highly radioactive material. Despite these dangers, the liquidators worked tirelessly to contain the disaster and prevent further harm. Many of the liquidators suffered from acute radiation sickness, with symptoms including nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Long-term health effects including cancer and other illnesses have also been reported among the liquidators. The liquidators played a very vital role in preventing further harm from the Chernobyl disaster, and they are often referred to as heroes for their bravery and their sacrifice. Many have received recognition mission and awards for their efforts, but many continue to suffer from the long-term health effects of their exposure to the radiation. In our number 6 spot today, we have the abandoned amusement park. The Pripyat amusement park, located in the town of Pripyat in Ukraine, was set to open on May 1st, 1986, just days after the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. The park was intended to be a celebration of the town's prosperity and the Soviet Union's technological achievements, but it never opened its doors to the public due to the disaster. The park features a fair wheel, bumper cars, a carousel, and other rides, which still stand today as an eerie reminder of the town's abandoned past. The Ferris wheel is particularly haunting, with rusted and decaying carts. The amusement park was never fully completed, and its rides were never tested or operated, and today it serves as a chilling symbol of the devastating impact of the Chernobyl disaster on the town and its people. Despite the danger posed by the high levels of radiation in the area, the Pripyat amusement park has become a popular destination for tourists tourists seeking to witness the haunting beauty of the abandoned rides and the town itself. In our number 5 spot today, we have the pilot. This is another first-hand account from right after the disaster, and this one comes from Igor Pismensky, who was a helicopter navigator following the disaster. After the meltdown, helicopter crews were sent out to try and spread decontamination materials over the site. One of these crews was actually killed trying to do this work after they crashed at the site. Of the disaster, Igor said, quote, They told us there had been an explosion at the plant.
plant so they needed our help. The mission was, after the firemen, to drop down loads of stuff from helicopters to the destroyed reactor. First sand, then lead, dolomite, boron. We would load up about 15 kilometers distance from the reactor. They would put sandbags into parachutes. Then we would take off and pass around in a conveyor fashion. There would be a circle of up to 40 helicopters in the air, which would fly over and right above the reactor every two to three minutes. No one opened the windows. The chopper was all shut, but it was not airtight. It was not protected against radiation. The view of the destroyed reactor down below, after the main fire had been put out, you could see separate glowing reddish fire beds in the first days. This was the view from the height of 200 meters. Of course, we knew this was dangerous, but what we did not have was adequate protective gear for the mission, but that's the responsibility of those who sent us there. Radiation is considered invisible. It cannot be seen, but you can feel it. That is, you can feel a certain metallic taste in your mouth and a sore throat. Radiation never passes without a trace, so the consequences are always there, and radiation usually hits precisely those parts of the body that are the most vulnerable. So for everyone who's gone through Chernobyl, there are consequences. I remember so well the first time we flew over Pripyat town. The whole town had been evacuated by then, but everything looked sort of surreal. Linen is hanging on laundry lines, on balconies, you see dropped bicycles, abandoned cars, no life around, all people gone, but their stuff is still there. When the catastrophe happened, there was the Soviet Union. We had 15 constituent republics playing their part in handling this mess. Today, no country in the world would be in a position to handle the problem of this magnitude if it happened again. In our number four spot today, we have the elephant's foot. The elephant's foot is a highly radioactive mass of corium that was formed during the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. It is named after its shape, which resembles that of an elephant's foot. The corium was formed when the reactor's core melted down, causing a mixture of melted nuclear fuel, concrete, and other materials to form into a highly radioactive mass. The elephant's foot is estimated to have had a temperature of around 2,700 degrees Celsius at the time of the accident and emitted lethal levels of radiation. The initial workers who tried to remove the elephant's foot from the reactor died within weeks due to the radiation exposure. Today, the elephant's foot remains extremely radioactive and is still inaccessible. It is estimated to be one of the most dangerous objects in the world, with exposure to it resulting in almost certain death within minutes. In our number three spot today, we have Kopachi. Kopachi was a village in Ukraine that was affected by the disaster. The village was situated close to the nuclear power plant, and its residents were exposed to high levels of radiation. To contain the spread of contamination, the Soviet government ordered the evacuation and burial of the village, including burying the contaminated soil under a layer of clean soil. Today, Kopachi remains abandoned and designated as a part of the exclusion zone around the Chernobyl plant. The village and surrounding area serve as a reminder of the devastating consequences of nuclear disasters and the importance of nuclear safety. In our number two spot today, we have the plant. It might come as a surprise, but the Chernobyl nuclear plant didn't just shut down entirely after the disaster. Despite the contamination and the risks associated, they continued to use the plant for years to come. Reactor 4, which exploded during the accident, was completely destroyed, and the other reactors were shut down over time. The Soviet government continued to use parts of the plant for several years to generate electricity and heat for the surrounding area, but eventually the plant was decommissioned. It wasn't until December of 2000 that the final reactor, Reactor 3, was shut down. Reactor 2 was shut down in 1991, and 1 was shut down in 1996. It is thought that the plant should be fully out of use by 2028. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the containment. After the disaster took place, the damaged reactor, reactor number four, was sealed in a heavy concrete sarcophagus that was meant to keep the radiation concealed and contained. While this may seem like a foolproof plan, there are many debates about how effective this containment actually is and how effective it may or may not continue to be. These are, of course, super important questions and considering the fact that it's something we've never really had to deal with before in any way, how are we really supposed to know until we we try. The building of a new structure called the New Safe Confinement Structure started in 2006 and it was completed in 2017. The new structure is 843 feet wide, 531 feet long, and 356 feet tall and is meant to keep the reactor and its previous sarcophagus contained for at least the next 100 years. Despite that relatively short amount of time, experts say that the exclusion zone and surrounding area will remain uninhabitable for the next 20,000 years. Number 10, Nagoro, Japan. 
From the outside, this city may seem like any other small riverside village in Japan, but the scariest part of this town is its residents. As you journey through the town, you might see an elderly couple tending to their garden, people shopping at the grocery store, and children attending school. But look closely and you will realize that these people aren't actually people, they are life-size dolls. Only around 20 citizens of the village are actual living, breathing humans, the youngest being over 50 years old. So then, why is there a school full of children? 12 plush scarecrows sit at their desks doing homework while being taught by an equally felted teacher. These tableaus are present throughout the entirety of the village, especially in the abandoned and fading buildings, adding a constant creepy aura to the sleepy little town. It began in 2002 when a resident created a scarecrow of her father, and it has only continued to grow since then. Number 9. Centralia, Pennsylvania Forget Hunger Games The Girl on Fire, Centralia, Pennsylvania is the city on fire. This ghost town in the United States used to have thousands of residents, and had a booming economy and infrastructure thanks to the lengthy coal mines around and underneath the town. In the 60s, however, they discovered they had an issue with illegal dumping and built a massive landfill, and eventually it came time to burn it out. What they didn't realize, however, was that there was a hole connected to the mines at the bottom of the garbage, and the fire quickly spread to the coal mines beneath the town. They didn't realize it until smoke started billowing out of the ground, and they discovered that there was no way to put the fire out. Residents were forced out of the town as the fire was causing people to pass out in their homes, and massive sinkholes were opening up in the ground. Some people fought to stay, however, and the once bustling town now has only about five residents. To this day, the fires are still burning, and the coal underground could allow the town to burn for another 250 years. Number 8. Gomentong Caves in Malaysia this one doesn't come with any horrible tragedy or ghost story, but is instead a terrifying destination for those of us who hate creepy crawlies. When you first enter Gomentong Caves in Malaysia, you'll notice a large amount of excrement on the ground. That's because the caves are home to almost 2 million bats that sleep there during the day. When you get further in, the walls and floors seem to be moving. That's because what's left behind by bats attracts millions of cockroaches into the caves. It's almost impossible to take a step without trampling on a few of the creatures, so it's probably a good idea not to wear your favorite shoes if you plan on taking a tour. It doesn't end there though, as the caves are also home to swarms of giant millipedes. So basically it just sounds like somewhere I have absolutely no interest in visiting. But apparently at around 8pm every night, you can see the bats leaving the cave in what looks like a massive black vortex. So if you're willing to kiss a few cockroaches to be able to see that, well that's your choice. Number 7. Ha Par Villa in Singapore this theme park is one of those places that you just can't believe somebody actually thought, hey, this is a good idea, and went ahead with building it. Hopar Villa in Singapore is an amusement park that is home to mostly creepy and bizarre statues. This place is known as basically the opposite of Disneyland, as it is themed after the underworld, and the main attraction is the Ten Courts of Hell. It was built and intended to teach children about morality, with statues of people being punished for committing certain and crimes. I think it would be enough to just tell the children that if they sin, they'll have to spend the afterlife at this theme park. Statues include things like animals eating people, half human, half crab creatures, and various other gory tableaus. For those who are fans of the creepy and macabre, this may be a top tier destination spot, but for the rest of us, I think I'll just stick with Disney for now. Number 6. The Stanley Hotel in Colorado if you're a fan of The Shining, then you're probably already aware of the Stanley Hotel, as this creepy hotel was the basis for the setting of the movie, a visit in 1974 inspiring Stephen King to write the novel. And the pet cemetery on site of the hotel would also serve as inspiration for another book you would write, of course, Pet Cemetery. 
The large estate sitting at the bottom of the Rocky Mountains has a long history, as well as a long history of ghostly hauntings and inexplicable encounters. A ghost tour highlights a lot of the main specters that are said to roam the rooms and halls of the hotel. Stanley himself and his wife Flora apparently remain there, seen within the bar and playing the piano respectively. A few of the rooms are reportedly haunted with specific ghosts. 407 haunted by Lord Dunraven and 418 is haunted by children who can be heard laughing. Stephen King had stayed within room 217, outside of which a ghost of a young boy is said to appear. The author said he had seen the child himself and that he was apparently calling out for his nanny. Number 5. Paveglia Island in Italy Known as Italy's most haunted island and sometimes considered one of the most haunted places in the world, Paveglia Island is home to a long and twisted history. When the bubonic plague was sweeping populations, those who were sick were sent off to Paveglia Island as a sort of quarantine zone, and the same happened when the Black Death was going around. In the late 1800s, an asylum was built on the island. It was poorly constructed and wasn't really used as a place for healing or caring for the sick, but instead as a place of exile for them to be kept away from the rest of the community and to spend the rest of their days. In the 1930s, there was apparently a cruel doctor running the asylum, who was responsible for doing unethical experiments on the patients. Eventually, he fell from the bell tower, and while it's long gone, people say that they can still hear the chimes of the bell coming from the island. It is apparently crawling with the ghosts of the many souls who passed away there over the centuries. If you want to check it out for yourself though, you may find it quite difficult, as Italy prevents any tourists from visiting the island, and there is a lengthy application process to even be considered. Number 4. Tronquille Sanatorium in Kamloops, British Columbia Going up to the Great White North, Tronquille Sanatorium in British Columbia is known as one of the most haunted places in Canada. It was built in 1907 to treat people who were suffering from tuberculosis. It operated this way for many decades until it eventually closed its doors in 1958, as anti-tuberculosis medicine came around in 1940. It became a mental health institution before later becoming a detention facility for young offenders. As with Paveglia, the history of disease and death has led many to believe that the facility and grounds are incredibly haunted, and many people have reported large amounts of paranormal experiences. There are apparently various different ghosts you can spot there, like a mother crying for her child or the sound of children playing. And many people have shared photos from the facility where you can see ghost orbs or the outlines of figures in the dark. One of the main highlights, however, is the tunnels underneath, which were used for transportation and are apparently incredibly haunted. Wanted. If you're interested, the farm that is now on the property offers tours and even escape rooms. Number 3. Hoyabashu Forest in Romania Known as one of the most haunted forests in the world, Hoyabashu is known as the Bermuda Triangle of Romania. The first thing that you'll notice when looking at pictures of the forest are the trees that appear crooked and bent, looking like they're contorting and reaching out for something. There are many legends surrounding the forest, most to do with ghostly and paranormal sightings. There's one story of a girl who disappeared into the forest, only to reappear five years later with no memory of what had happened or where she had been. She was wearing the same clothing and apparently hadn't aged at all. There's also another story about a sheep herder and his entire flock of 200 sheep which vanished into the woods, never to be seen again. Those who do enter the forest and make it back out find themselves with mysterious headaches, rashes and burns with no known explanation. And you know I can't make it through a list without mentioning aliens, so yes, there have been numerous reports of UFOs and extraterrestrials residing within the forest. Number 2. The Paris Catacombs Claustrophobic underground tunnels filled with 6 million bodies? Of course it's haunted. The Paris catacombs were created in the 18th century when the cemeteries were becoming overcrowded and they needed to find a quick solution. The 200 miles of tunnels lined with skeletons are home to plenty of ghost stories, legends, and petrifying encounters. 
One of the most famous stories comes from the 1990s when a group was exploring the dark tunnels and they found an abandoned camera. It had footage on it and when they played it, they were disturbed to find footage of a man who was clearly lost, running through the catacombs before he eventually drops the camera. Nobody knows what happened to the man or where he ended up. It's also said that if you're there after midnight, the walls will start to speak to you. Dismembered voices urging you to venture deeper and deeper into the tomb until you're no longer able to find your way out. Number 1. The Island of the Dolls in the mid 20th century, a man named Don Julian left his wife to live alone on an island on a lake in Mexico. Shortly after he had moved there, he discovered the body of a girl in the river, followed by a doll floating by. He took the doll and hung it from a tree in an attempt to appease the girl's spirit, but apparently it wasn't enough. For the next 50 years, he would collect dolls from the trash and canals and hang them from all the trees on the island. The dolls and toys are all in various states of disrepair some completely falling apart, making it one of the creepiest islands on earth. In 2001, Don Julian himself passed away, his body being discovered in the river. The dolls that still remain on this island to this day are supposedly haunted, there being many reports of their eyes moving to look at you, their arms moving as though to reach out to you, and apparently whispering to each other in the night. If the photos of the island aren't enough to scare you away, you can get onto the island for yourself for just around $2 a person. But once again, I'll leave the exploration up to you guys. Thank you.